is Veronica Melendez. She's a UTEP alum with a Bachelor's of Arts in Musical Theater, hence the little music note right here. Uh, a Master's of Science, in, she has a Master's of Science in Speech Language Pathology, and she has been a licensed speech pathologist for the past eight years. So thank you for coming on to our little mini show here. Oh, thank and you for I having me. I wanted to ask, of course, what are you sipping on this morning? Well, I was going to be fancy, you know, and go downstairs to get a cup of, of, um, of hotel coffee. But instead, it's just water for now. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Cheers. 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 That is perfectly fine. You need to hydrate. I'm over here dehydrating while you're hydrating. So that's good. And water's good for your throat. <laughs> that's Absolutely. Segue. That's what I was thinking. I was like, okay, I'm just going to promote the water thing, you know, because hydration. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. And we're going to, that's a question I'm going to ask maybe a little bit later about the water. Um, I want to ask you a fun question, though, about UTEP, since you are a UTEP alum. What is a unique experience that, you've ha that you have had on the UTEP campus? If you can remember your UTEP years, what so is So long ago. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a whole lot. Um, when I was doing my undergrad, doing musical theater, there were tons of really awesome memories. Um, doing the shows was always an amazing experience. So for every show, it was super unique. And, you know, you get to, to know your cast as family. So you grow and then you split up and then you come back together. And so those were always really special memories. And then doing my master's, honestly, the master's program is just so incredibly busy that there aren't those um, tiny special memories, you know, that you can actually like hone in on. But there are several because the people that you are growing with, um, you create like just these special bonds that are never really broken, you know, and I you know. always you always go back to your class to um, you rely on them for information. Hey, did I miss this or taking naps on their couch because you just <laughs> exhausted it. That's a, it's you're in the trenches together and it builds this really strong, close knit family. So I like that you mentioned that. That's a big one. But I want to go back to what you said. I know you have your uh, bachelor's in musical theater and you did a lot of uh, performances here. What was your favorite performance um, being a part of, if you have one? Oh, man. Oh, there were so many. I think the very first one was really special to me. Uh, it was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And it was just that it was, um, I was a freshman and so I auditioned and then all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, you're one of the leads. And I was like, how am I going to do this? You know? So it was, it was incredible an incredible experience um, because they break you to build you, you know? And, oh. and as a freshman, you, you struggle with getting to know the campus, getting to know what your what you're doing in your classes and then right. to be doing that craziness. Um, so yeah, that was a really fun, fun experience. experience. That is really cool, your freshman year as a lead role. So thank you for sharing that. And that was your bachelor focus. So that's even more of a motivation to continue. So that's Absolutely. awesome. So I want to jump into a day in the life of a speech pathologist. Okay. Um, because before COVID, I wanted to ask the before, because I know COVID has changed a lot of things. I want, what's a typical day look like for you? What was your experience being a speech pathologist before COVID? Right. So before COVID, I actually, what's really cool about being a speech pathologist is that there's so many different things that you can be into. So you can work in a skilled nursing facility where you get people that are um, sometimes higher level um, that have had a stroke or something like that. And you have to rehabilitate their swallowing or since they've had a stroke, they've lost all of their ability to communicate. They don't have words. They don't have the ability to name things. So that's what you work on in that. Um, in the school system, you get to work uh, with children with autism, or you get to work with uh, the little ones who can't pronounce, or they have disfluent speech, so they stutter, different things like that. Um, a private clinic with kiddos, you get to work all of that, but a more one-to-one -one basis. So I got, fortunately, before COVID happened, I got to work in all of those. I got to work in a rehabilitation hospital, which was, I think, is my favorite. Um, so in that, you get the people that have had a bad car accident or um, a severe stroke, but they're really young, like in their 20s or 30s. You get to work with PTSD from our soldiers. So just several different things like that. And I got to work all of those. So they all look a lot different. 
um, when you're working at the school, you know you're in there real early and you have your groups of students. Um, you go through the day just um, like a teacher would almost. Yeah. You know, you're just, you get your class and you go in. It's just back to back. So I don't know, hands and shout out to all teachers because whoo, that's a, <laughs> that's a hard one. And, it was and then, teacher... um, so right, right before COVID happened, I was actually working as PRN, which is as needed, as requested, because I have a little one. And so I wanted to be able to spend a whole lot of time with him and set my schedule the way that I wanted it to be. Again, that's what's awesome about being a speech pathologist is the ability to do that. I haven't run into very many jobs that you can just be like, oh, no, sorry, I can't go in or pick and choose your times. And, you know, yeah. so it's just been amazing an amazing amazing job like oh i love it so much <laughs> I love, i'm so and the way you speak about it shows that you're very very passionate about it and that you have eight years and you've experienced so much already and just being able to tell our students the different areas and have personal experience in those and i was actually going to ask you what your favorite one was so thank you for sharing that one and uh that was all before covid and so now switching over and like you said you had a little one what was it like being a speech pathologist? Did you work from home? Did you have to, were you staying in the clinic? Because I know you were, uh, being a speech pathologist, you're a health professional. Um, and right. That's a lot of frontline workers. So what was it like during and even now after? So um, once it did get, like I said, I could make my schedule. So once it did, I was working in skilled nursing facilities in a rehab hospital. Um, I was working at three different facilities at the time and the rehab hospital. So that was four of them. And I would hop around. But once it did get real close um, to the point where I was working with some of them that were COVID positive, I got really scared. Um, because yeah. it was so unknown. Like it was like, can you touch a doorknob? Or what was <laughs> yeah. it like, you know, and so yeah. I was, I was a bit paranoid because of my little guy. And mm -hmm. my dad also because my dad's older, so I didn't want to give it to him. Um, so it was just the fact that it was so unknown. The tests were not rapid tests either. So you were working with these patients and you didn't know if they were positive. And then you would find out later and you're like, ah, did I infect anybody? You know, it was, it was really, really scary. So I did leave um, those, all of the facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really heartbreaking for me because that was my favorite thing to do. Yeah. But as soon as that ended, I started um, a new job, which was telehealth. And I'm actually working with a company outside of Dallas, and I've been with them for over a year now. Um, what's awesome about being a speech pathologist is that the turnover is so quick. You can, I was able to find a job within four days of leaving my others. Oh my gosh, that's great. It was amazing. Like literally, I put in my application, they called me within an hour, and I had a new job. Oh my gosh. So it's fantastic. So um, working for Dallas, it, are, are you in Dallas? You said, I, I, are, you quit those. Did you move to Dallas or how is the Dallas job working? No, I'm actually able to do all of it from home. So I'm working for a company outside of Dallas at my own home in El Paso. How so are you doing I, <laughs> It's magic. <laughs> internet magic. <laughs> Oh, that's true. We got, we learned a lot of internet magic this past year. So it's been, it's definitely ex an experience because, you know, you're so used to like working with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so I did a ton of classes online to make sure I was like, can I really do this? Like, am I, am I going to do justice for these kiddos, you know? And yeah. I was able to learn so much. I literally took like seven classes <laughs> to make sure that I was, I was ready to go. And yeah, as a matter of fact, they just offered me an administrative um, position helping train other SLPs doing telehealth. So I'm super excited and grateful. Well, congratulations. Um, that sounds thanks. awesome. Yeah, so I'm, I'm loving it. I'm still gonna be treating all of my kiddos. And what's crazy about it is that they learn so quick and I'm wondering if it is really just because of the tech, you know? So these kids are just drawn to like the telephone, the tablets, the TV, and we're always trying to pull it away from them, you know, but when you're actually educating them and in their yeah. face and telling them, look, this is what this does. And 
it seems to really be working really, really well. I've graduated like five, six of them. So, uh, that's very interesting to hear your perspective coming from, you know, working person to person versus working virtually. And that little, like, that's something to tap into that, how, how that's mm -hmm. actually changing the way they think. And that's actually a great way. And it's connecting health and technology in a way that maybe people didn't think about and it's possible now. So yeah. you're a success story. That is so awesome that you're able to do that. Yeah. I just need to grab all the data now. <laughs> Yeah, that's somebody else. No, I'm just kidding. I was going to ask you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want to do that. How did you, <laughs> how are you doing it virtual? Because speech pathology takes a lot of interaction, seeing the throat, using the mouth. If I'm not, like, correct me if I'm wrong. How are you doing that virtual? What does that look like for you? Right. That's so, so fascinating. right now I am working with kiddos virtually. And so it's, okay. it's technically still up to the clinician. The clinician has to be very honest in their documentation. You have to um, rationalize your treatment all the time. And if you can't provide the treatment for it, then you have to pass it along to somebody in person. So there have been several that are way okay. too severe of, um, that I'm not able to control the, the situation. You know, mom will sometimes hand them the phone and the kid is just off and that won't work. So if that's the way it's going to be, then I can't do the treatment like that. Fortunately, okay. if you have them engaged, how we're engaging right now, they're able to learn just perfectly. Um, also like how you're saying about the mouth and stuff, what's really cool is mom can just get a flashlight and a camera and get up in there. And I'm like, Whoa, okay. Yeah. And zooming in, you know, and I can see all of the stuff that's happening in the throat. As far as the, the actual physical touching of the throat and the mouth and stuff, I can't do that. Right. Um, so sometimes I'll ask the parent to, um, it's just comes with a lot of education. Yeah. You know, and it's good so, for them to know. Yeah, I have to just teach them. This is what you're going to look for. This is what you're going to feel. And then um, having them tell me what they're feeling, but not okay. necessarily doing any diagnosis from there. Okay. No, that's just, it's so fascinating. And I wonder if schools are, and, and universities and colleges are starting to transform the way they teach or adding this, because this is new. That, well, I don't know if it's new, but it's, it, <clears throat> it's evolving now because of COVID. And so I wonder if they're teaching this to students now. That's interesting. I wonder. I wonder. I don't know. So the professors at UTEP are awesome. They really, really are great. The education that I, I received there was amazing. Um, it's very evidence-based practice. It's a lot of research, which I loved. It's definitely difficult to do it now, um, practicing, but it would be, mm. it's, you can do it. It just requires a lot. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's possible. So thank you for sharing that. I want to jump into your undergrad years um, with your, your Bachelor of Arts in Musical Theater. During your, those years, how did your degree help you enter into the speech uh, pathology program? So with that kind of bachelor's, how did you get into the master's program? What, what kind of skills did you learn from there to support it? So doing musical theater, I learned a lot about, um, well, several different aspects. <clears throat> I learned how the voice works. I learned the mechanism of it. I learned upscales, downscales, just what the voice is supposed to sound like, a healthy voice. And then um, I learned from the theater aspect of it, how to deal with people, how to interact, how different people are going to interact, and how to read a room, <laughs> you know, how yeah. to read your, I don't know, address your surroundings and adapt to them. Um, so those are the two main things that I think I learned is how the actual voice and mechanism and phonation, everything works, and then how to interact um, and that's so or to be engaging. Yeah, the skill of like, what is it? Uh, knowing your audience, feeling the vibe in the room and being able to adjust to mm -hmm. that, especially if you have, uh, you're dealing with kiddos right now. And if they're having a bad day, being able to sense that and, utilize and you know, that honestly, it's the same with adults. When you're working with these people in skilled nursing facilities, they've just gone through something traumatic in their life. That's true. And you're in there, hi, good morning. They're like, good morning. What world are you from? Don't you know my back is broken? You yep. know? And so you just have to kind of like take it and, oh. Adjust, read, like adjust the other room. <laughs> oh, I love yeah. it. You're so bubbly, so bringing that in, I'm pretty sure it makes them very happy uh, at, at the end of it, if they're not happy at first. <laughs> at the, at the end, I get thanked at the beginning. They're like, lady, get out of my room. <laughs> I don't want to deal with you. I don't want that in my room today. <laughs> okay, 
So thank you for sharing that about your undergrad, helping you with the, 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 the pathology program, sweet pathology program, forgive me. Um, during your years of education or even during your career, were there any mentors or did you find anybody that could support you and who were they? How did they help you to develop yourself into the professional you are now? There have been several. Like I said, all of the professors with the speech pathology program are incredible. Actually, I still reach out to a couple of them. Um, they're amazing That's people. Perfect. And then, of course, like my family, my husband, uh, our friends, they're just an incredible backbone to escape the, the reality sometimes of, of school, you know, because it's, it's definitely a competitive program. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as getting there, yes, actually, there were a couple of people in, in the music building that I was like, help, I need letters of recommendation. <laughs> and, you know, they need to know who I am. And so that was incredibly helpful also. So there have been several professors along the way, family, friends, all that have been awesome. And I like how you said that because a lot of people think that mentors have to be these big professionals that have been super successful in their lives. But a lot of the time it can just be a family, a member, an aunt, an uncle, mm -hmm. a friend that supports your, your, you in a different way. So thank you for bringing that up. A lot of people think that they need just professional mentors. It's like you need personal ones too as well. And that helps. Absolutely. Yeah. Even though they're unofficial sometimes. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. They're helpful. I, they, exactly. it, takes a, it takes a team definitely to develop a person. I completely agree. And especially with your positivity, I'm pretty sure uh, you have great people in your life. I do. <laughs> I have awesome attracted friends. Attracted to you. Um, I did want to bring in, uh, you talked about you entering a room with your, with your personality. And a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like that. Um, what is the hardest part about your job? Even, oh, right now, even virtually, it's not, um, it could be the technology, but what's the hardest part about your job and how do you normally deal with it, especially in the health profession? Um, I find, so honestly, the telehealth stuff is not easy. Um, you do depend highly on the parent, you know, so I have to educate them. Education right now has just been the best thing, just sharing, being an open book about it. A lot of people are like, I don't want you to do this with my kid. Let me explain to you what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. You know, so just knowing, sharing your knowledge has been awesome. Yeah. And like you said, the technology, honestly, the technology is probably um, the most difficult part of what I do. <laughs> it's not, it's not hard. It really isn't hard, but it's just a lot a lot a lot so you're having to provide awesome documentation because these people mm -hmm. can't see you or supervise you you're your own boss right you know and so yeah. you're making the clinical decisions and then later on the state of texas is the one evaluating all of it they go through your notes Ooh. and they do check everything um so if something's not right you can lose your license so you just like kind of keep that in mind while you're doing it <laughs> you know um yes but like i said honestly it's just been an open book to these parents and sharing the same with the adult patients. This mm -hmm. is why I'm in here. This is why we're going to talk about this. Yes. So the hardest part is it's not so much educating, but making sure that they are educated and open to re the services and know what's going on. And then documenting uh, your information, especially if you're telehealth, you were saying, because there's really nobody above you you are essentially mm -hmm. your own boss and that can, right. it's a good it's a good thing but you also want to make sure that you are watching your own back uh for your notes and your documentation are doc <laughs> is documenting a difficult part of your job is it just is it time consuming yeah that's the worst it? that's the worst yeah. part of the job <laughs> <laughs> oh, everything like else is fun i get to literally i get to play all day that's oh, what that's i do so i play i play and i talk that's it's a I disneyland job that's amazing. Oh, well, that's good. That means you're passionate about it and you love what you do when, it be, when it's fun to do all day. So that's awesome. So for those who are going to speak pathology, make sure that you're passionate about it. Here's someone you can talk to if you want to about what Absolutely. she's gone through and what she's needed to find that passion. And so I actually want to ask that. How did you get into speech pathology being that you have a, your bachelor's in musical theater? What, what, what was that ding point or was it something you always wanted to do? So no, it wasn't. I actually didn't know about it. Um, my mom actually had had a stroke. And when she was in the hospital okay. doing her rehab, they came in with a student. And 
of course I asked, I was like, well, can I sit here and watch? And I said, sure. And so she was doing the evaluation and she was said, do an ascending scale. So it's supposed to be like, ah, because that's how you check to see the, uh, how your larynx and everything is moving. So she had her do it up and she had to do it down. And so the lady was teaching at the time and the girl, the student didn't know what it sounded like. And I was like, I got this. I know this. <laughs> I know what this sounds and I was like. like hmm. And then, you know, she just proceeded with the evaluation and I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And I thought it was really cool. So after I had graduated, completely graduated, I didn't even like continue looking into it. After I graduated, <laughs> I was working um, at Gymboree Play and Grow. So it was a learning yeah, facility yeah. for these little ones. And I just kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And then so at the time I told my boyfriend, I was like, hey, I want to do that. And he's like, well, go, go check it out. And of course, family was very much like, no, you need to go to New York and Broadway and sing and all of this oh. stuff. And I was like, I don't think that's going to happen, guys. <laughs> I was like, mm, I might be okay, but not that amazing right. that I'm going to be able to like go land a, a Broadway gig, you know? Oh, and so God. I decided to check out the program. Um, I started doing my um, two years. It was a, it, it was in interesting. I don't really know how it works now, what they're doing, but mm -hmm. um, you have to do leveling courses. Okay. So they bring you up to a certain level that they find appropriate. Then you can apply to the program. So once you apply to the program, you have to see if you get in. For my class, a lot applied. Um, I want to say that it was somewhere like 85 applied and 20 some, 21 yeah. got in about right. and 19 graduated. So it was definitely a competitive program. I was very, very fortunate to get in, to be allowed in from these wonderful people. And um, yeah. It changed a lot. It. I, I just, I'm so in awe of the fact that you did musical theater and you were going to go into it and that was your thing. And then you were just at a doctor's appointment. This happens a lot. I hear this through a lot of health professions that especially like physical therapy or occupational, they went through an injury yeah. and they met these professions that they didn't know about originally. And so it's awesome to hear your side of the story that you were just sitting in the room with your mom and you're like, can I stay here? I want to see what you guys do, especially more out of like cariño, uh, more out of affection than anything yeah. else. And then your future to a job that you actually, a career you love. Like, that's a really cool story. It's almost like a romantic story. You felt, it was a meet cute. <laughs> it was a meet cute. So I like that you shared that, that you were open to, to just learning about something new and it changed your life. <laughs> and it, it did happen instantly. Thank you for sharing that too. It wasn't like you started applying into it. You, mm -hmm. it just, it stayed in the back of your head and right. that's how it happens sometimes. And that's the thing that's also, um, I felt like speech pathology was such, I still think that it's such a, a funky title for it, for what we do. There's so much to being a speech pathologist. Mm -hmm. um, so we just say speech, but it's overall communication. It's everything, mm -hmm. receptive communication, being able to understand, is the person understanding? What are they understanding? And then mm -hmm. expressive communication, are they able to express themselves? How are they expressing themselves? Right? So pretty much like working with kids, any action that they're giving you, it's because they're trying to communicate it, but sometimes they don't have the words to do so. Same thing with adults after something traumatic, they're just not able to either understand you or to express it. That and is so, so fascinating. I didn't know that. You guys didn't yeah. know that? <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, then you have dysphagia, right? So dysphagia is um, swallowing problems. Mm -hmm or chewing or you know there's just so many different things um to it and so that's why i am totally available for for any kind of questions because i don't even know what we would be called a brain therapist i, I have no idea <laughs> i like um, the communication it's all processes yeah. of communication and the reason that's why it's awesome. pathology a lot of it gets mixed up too the reason we're called pathologists not just therapists is because we have the ability to diagnose. And so you diagnose several different um, problems that mm -hmm. a person might have. Okay, so that's, I'm, that's just so fascinating that that's something you, you learn. And then 
your experiences, those eight years really develop you and being able to catch that to where you can do it virtually now. And so that's just fantastic. Yeah. I'm just in awe of what you've done. Um, I want to just, cause I, I know we're going to wrap up here pretty soon. I want you to think about um, your undergrad, looking back to your undergrad and graduate years. What are some things that you wish you knew going into the program and going into the career that you're in right now that maybe some students could take back with them before they start the program? Oh, man, I was just talking to one of our friends about this that went to college with us. Um, uh -huh. We had gone to a UTEP football game and everybody was just like all of the <laughs> students are just so involved in what's going on. And I remember there being just drama, you know, like, oh, my gosh, this just drama, like typical drama. And I was like, none of that's important. If I would have just let some of that go and just know that it's going to be okay. Like, get through it. Just get through it and ride those waves because there are plenty of them. Mm -hmm. As long as you just keep on going and keep on swimming and keep on looking forward, there's going to be success. Like, there is success. Oh. And that was amazing. <laughs> I got goosebumps. It's there, because it's so true, you know, you're so involved in, oh my gosh, well, this girl said that I was supposed to turn in this assignment. You know what? Go talk to the source. Just get it. Take, take care of your stuff. Just take care of everything. Just keep going. There are some rough patches, especially in grad school. Um, it's hard, but it is so incredibly worth it. And I can't express that enough, even through your undergrad. So in undergrad, if I would have just focused a little bit more because I was very distractible um, because it was fun, you know? It seems um, like a theater that sounds like so much fun. So yeah. It was. It was so much fun. But I, I was distracted. As long as you have a real nice GPA, which undergrad is super easy to get that because you can take a class, ace it, and whoop, your GPA raises, you know, high, high, high GPAs you're into the program. Well, not, not immediately. I mean, they are competitive, but right. <laughs> it's but it very helps. helpful. Right. It, helps it was very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so your tip and your, uh, from your undergrad, something that you wish you knew was to avoid the drama and avoid the, he said, she said, and get to the source, focus on you. It is university as a lot of students find out when they, their freshman year is an eye kind of moment in your life where you are developing yourself as a professional as a as a student and by allowing those dramatic experiences like impact you from just homework and and like you said drama in school it's affecting your path and so just being able to just turn that off as much as possible and focus on you yeah just keep going even in the rough patches just keep going don't give up Oh, thank you. Thank you. And that was, the, I was, my last one was the last tip. So I think that was the best last tip. Oh. <laughs> just, keep going. just keep swimming, Dory style. Just keep swimming. Yes, just keep swimming. So thank you for joining us this morning. Well, it's my morning. I, I don't know if it's, no, it's, it's, it's still your morning. Over here. Yeah, I was like, it's still your morning. <laughs> thank you for joining us this morning. I really appreciate you sharing your insight on speech pathology, what you're doing right now before COVID, during COVID, and even after COVID and how it's impacted your career the journey you took from undergrad and your experiences on finding your passion. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great vacation and enjoy your, the rest of your week. Thank and, you. Uh, of course. Any last words for our audience here? No, um, please feel free to contact Gabby if you need to talk to me or you want to know any more about speech pathology. Um, I really, really do like to, to educate and tell you guys what it's about. So I'm totally here. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you all. We'll see you all next week on Career Conversation Cafe. Have a great one and go Miners. Go Miners. Bye. Bye.